advice to government. I ended up spending so much time with family, which is good, but ended up spending so much money at the same time as well. But I ended up being like one of those Chinese tourists going on four day tour of in and around Seoul, sort of like first day was, I know those of you who took my financial economic class, you know, financial econometrics class, ignore for a second. Um, first day was what? 광화문, 경복궁, 삼청동, 인사동. 그러고서는 청계천 놀다가 시청, 세티호, and everything. Second day was going to Lotte Wilde and then just having my child spend every, you know, like whole afternoon there with aquarium and everything. Third day, I went to Isan and see that flower festival and then aquarium there again. Fourth day, zoo and Namsan and everything. So if this lecture had been Monday, I would have been basically just like dark circle all the way down here. Don't know where I am, etc., etc. everything. But luckily, I'm much better now. So hopefully that's good. Um, now, secondly, because I, because we missed so many lectures, I mean, Public holiday-wise, we are allowed to miss two, so we used up one election day and one temporary holiday, and that's good. Um, now, and I'm going to use everything up to week 16 Friday, so that's fine. So that leaves us with how to make up for lost one lecture, which basically will be done as much as possible through um, using up as much of the lecture time as possible. So the, an extra five minutes here, there, and everywhere. If I'm short of material, I mean, I wanted to cover up to so much under my um, lecture plan. If I can't cover it, then I may have to ask for some time in one lecture. I suppose I might have to overrun by, say, 20, 30 minutes. Barring that possibility, I think I can cover the material slightly quickly and try and make up the material. And, you don't have to have any lost time, even with, you know, those random unexpected holidays and everything. Okay. Now, um, as I also explained, I was gonna. So, the rest of the course will be assessed as follows. There will be a midterm exam on the Wednesday of week sixteen. But in the meantime, I'm also going to ask you to write a short report on, well, sort of like a short two-page-ish report on, um, it's going to be based on market structure, but that's not going to be announced until about next week, and it's not a major thing, you know, it's not a major assessment that carries incredible amount of weight or anything, and I just want you to think a little bit. You can't really think in the context of tests. So hopefully I want to give you that as an opportunity for you to think about what the sort of market structure that you see in our real lives are like. You know, I may ask you to provide some examples of monopolistic competition or oligopoly or monopoly or whatever and explain certain concepts a little bit more. Okay? Um, I may have to, I may try and pinpoint a particular industry, or may not, but um, that will be announced next week, and I'm going to explain what needs to be done, okay? So, towards the end of week nine, which wasn't a great thing to do, um, I sort of touched a little bit on what we are going to be learning for the next about three lectures worth. I'm hoping to finish the entire material by about Wednesday of next week, so that's about three lectures worth. Um, so producer theory-wise, we talked a little bit about inputs and outputs, factors of production, how land and capital and labor being the main factors of production are going to be transformed into a firm's output. And that's the, if you like, raison d'etre, you of these firms transforming these inputs into outputs and doing so in the process the firm earns its 
profit and how do you maximize your profit? Therein lies the key objective of the firm, profit maximization. Okay? So we sort of stopped about here. We talked about how, for example, increasing one input gives you higher output in terms of a production function wise. So input, output, sort of. A, it's a function of relationship, okay? And then um, there, here's the new thing we're going to talk about today. Another very useful way to depict the production relationship between input and output is something called isoquant. Or in Korean, 혹시 아시는 분 있나요? 등량 곡선이라고 합니다. 등량 곡선. 등량. Sounds funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 등량은 iso means same. It comes from Greek. Um, quant, amount of quantity. That's why 같은 양이다 해서 isoquant, 등량 곡선이라고 합니다. It's exactly like indifference curve. And therein lies the beauty of production sort of theory area. It's going to be a lot related to the material that we have already covered. Indifference curve wise, there's an exact corresponding relationship in producer theory. Okay? Now, um, Isoquant assumes that we have two main inputs. So generally, the assumption is that machines and humans are there to produce output. In other words, capital and labor. So this isoquant represents all possible capital, labor, combination. 자본과 노동의 combination들이 다 합쳐졌는데 Finish the sentence, please. That does what? Yield the same amount of output. So indifference curve was all combinations of good one and good two that give you the same amount of pleasure or utility, exactly like here. The same amount of capital or whatever combinations of capital and labor that can give you the same level of output. Yeah. How many iPhones? How many, I don't know. Um, what, what are the sort of, Hot gazettes nowadays. 좀, 좀 인기 있는 뭐 있나요? 요즘 하도 전자제품을 안 사가지고 요즘 뭐 특히 인기 있는 거. Like I mean, about a decade ago, when when I sort of about more than a decade ago now, when I was in university, you know, like we had to buy Walkman은 아니다. <웃음> 진짜 <웃음> Walkman은 진짜 아니다. 진짜. I, I, I was brought up on MP3 player days. I wasn't brought up on the Walkman days. That was, that's, that's for those people in their 40s. No offense, but those people in their 40s and over. I mean, I, what are you doing? No, 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 no. Let's not, let's, let, let's definitely not go there, okay? Um, so I, yeah. In about 2000, 2001, 2002, that's when sort of MP3 players kicked off. iRiver being sort of the famous Korean firm there and then. And then like um, downloading, pirating music from here and there and everywhere. That, that, those sort of days were like when, when everything you came out, you had to buy it sort of days. Oh, there's a new 128 megabyte MP3 player. It can take up to 40 songs. That's great. Nowadays, it's like 10 gigabytes or whatever. But yeah, I mean, gone are the days when we had to download songs and put it in the MP3 player. You, now you just stream everything. Yeah. But in my days, I, uh, my first ever internet contract was 500 megabytes a day maximum. That was a student deal. So. If I download about, if I had to download a Korean drama in UK, or whatever, I had to choose the lowest quality so that it wouldn't go over the 500 megabytes limit. But anyway, that's digressing a little bit. So that's sort of output we're talking about: MP3 players, smartphones, whatever. 
nowadays, what, what, I mean, what, what do we buy nowadays? I mean, apart from smartphones, there aren't that many new stuff that excites. Boy, now, I mean, like, in, even in the world of games, it's like so fixed onto Xbox 360, PS3, 4, whatever. Yeah, anyway. Each amount of those gazettes, those same outputs, that's going to be produced using labor and capital. So um, any combination of labor and capital that produces the same output is on the same isoquant, just like in different scale. But obviously, there are going to be different types of technology. That looks very familiar, right? Now, in consumption theory, what, what, what was that called? 이런 무차별 곡선 우리 뭐라 불렀죠? What did, what did we call? Perfect complement. So, in case of production, what would correspond to this sort of case? You have to have a fixed proportion of labor and fixed proportion of capital for output to work. Think about surgery. I mean, Nowadays, robots are trying to replace the surgeon, but even so, still, you can't have surgery without the surgeon, but for certain stuff like by heart quadruple bypasses or whatever, you can't do without those Da Vinci robots either. There has to be that machine, but there also has to be a qualified labor or very skilled labor doctor, neurosurgeon, operating it. So in the case of heart bypass, it would be cardio surgeon. But anyway, so that's a sort of a fixed proportion technology. One surgery machine, one doctor equal however many surgeries that can do one day. You can't replace that. Okay? Having 10 doctors and no surgery machine, you know, surgical robot doesn't do the job. You know, you can't go into the, the blood veins without use of these machines. But Machines own their own, can't do the job either. The pit doctor has to be there to pinpoint the blockage and they have to cut it there. But, um, and therefore, it's going to be in the familiar shape of minimum of something, minimum of capital and labor and something like that. Uh, so, another example that is commonly given is taxi company. For every driver, you have to have a taxi. For every taxi, you have to have a driver. But, you know, things are going to be changing now with all those self-driving cars and everything, but that's in the future. For now, driver, taxi, taxi, driver. No one can replace it. They cannot substitute each other. Both labor and capital must be provided at certain predetermined rates, predetermined proportions. One car, one driver. Okay? And that sort of line, what we call perfect substitutes. So in, you know, now that you've learned about consumer theory already, what sort of situation would this correspond to? So in other words, it's a case where a machine can produce 2,000 pins an hour. It's a machine specifically designed to produce pins. A human can put together the parts and make 50 pins an hour. The one machine equals 40 workers, nothing else. So that sort of situation is going to be called perfect substitute case. You either get the machine to do the job, um, or you can get humans to make, you know, manually manufacture those pins. Um, car production, to an extent, is like that. So, well, I mean, yes and no, but the stuff like, the, the top-end British manufacturers like Aston Martin, for example, still insist on making every part manually. Humans do the job. No machine involved. But, you know, car doors can nowadays be made just completely by the machines. Car engines can be made completely by the machines. It's a question there of replacing one or the other. Okay? So that will be just as in the consumer theory, a something additive. Ah, so here I used the figure of 3,000 pins and 60 pins, but no difference between using machine or worker. It's just a case of do you have 50 people or do you have one machine? Because 
They both will do exactly the same job, nothing else. But in reality, you know, it's, it's going to be somewhere in between. It's not going to be a straight line. It's not going to be a right angle-like shape. It's going to be somewhere in the middle, something like this, right? So a machine can replace workers, but not at perfect rate, yeah? Um, or, so, um, so for example, I don't know. Let's go back to the pin making situation. When you say that 50 workers can always replace one machine, that means that you can always find a potential pool of workers who can produce pins at exactly 60 an hour. 그죠? 한 시간에 정확히 딱 60개 만들 수 있는 사람이 무한대로 존재해서 무한대로 뽑아낼 수 있어야 기계 하나, 사람 50명 이런 식으로 완벽하게 대체가 되겠죠. But chances are it's not going to be the same, is it? I mean, you know, some human beings are better at certain things than others. So, for example, <laughs> Going back to Yebigun example once again, certain people are going to be good at shooting. They are going to be good at making a making a nice um, compact range of shots in little groups. Tanchakun, or others might be better at um, initiating stuff like first aid. But we, you know, I mean, it's quite difficult to find everyone having the same amount of proficiency and level of work and productivity, same across the board. Think about figure skating. No one can figure skate nowhere near as well as Kim Yona. Me trying to do the job, Kim Yona's job, that's not going to be A, pretty, and B, um, just not going to be able to do it. You know, I'm not going to be even able to jump twice, you know, yeah? let alone three, let alone triple axel or whatever. Yeah? So that's going to be different. So, uh, same with baseball. You know, we can find certain people who can pitch at 90 plus miles per hour. Me not being one of them. Chances are most of you can't either. So that's the reason why generally it takes a shape like this. And we can actually have a production function that takes a very similar shape to Cobb Douglas shape. It's actually a very nice approximation of production function in reality. It's A times first input to the power of A, second input to the power of B. Nothing new, right? But one crucial difference with consumer theory. So we say you don't have a The crucial difference with consumer theory is you can no longer use, please finish the sentence, monotonic transformation. Why? Because utility is an abstract concept. All you wanted to know was the order of the things, nothing else. Magnitude didn't matter. But output is something that you can observe. And how many of the damn MP3 player that that firm can produce. That's the key to the firm's revenue, profits, and everything. So the quantity matters in producer theory. Only the order matters in consumer theory. That's the reason why you can't put a log in there. You cannot change the power either. If all you care about is the order, you can. If you also care about the quantity, then you have to leave the production function exactly as it is. Nothing else. Okay? Um, now, as with preferences, we assume similar properties for production technology. First, technologies are assumed to be monotonic. Now, that seems like a very sort of redundant assumption, but in reality, that creates a lot of problems, okay? What monotonicity implies is, if you can produce 100 iPhones when you have 3,000 workers and 100 machines, 
you must also be able to produce more if you have 6,000 workers and 100 machines. Or at least as much as before. 최소한 전에 만들던 양만큼 만들어야 된다는 거죠. Uh, so what you cannot have in this situation is any sort of disruption or disorganization brought on by having additional machines or additional workers. Okay? What I mean by that is this. So, in reality, now this is going to be a major, major problem in about a month. Having 40 people in this lecture room, I must be able to generate certain amount of knowledge creation among you. Having extra 30 people in the class shouldn't make a difference on, 40, on my knowledge transfer to the existing 45 of you here. Having extra 30 people here. But that's not true, is it? You know, having extra 30 people in hot June weather means it's going to be incredibly hot with all the blinds down, all the windows closed, with air conditioning not working, and probably about seven or eight of you, especially those of you who are doing ROTC training, and etc., are likely to fall asleep. Um, I mean, not making any names or anything like that. But one comrade has already fallen down at the end of the lecture hall. So um, we're going to see a lot more of these when we have more people stuck into the same factory. So how do you justify this monotonicity assumption? The firm can choose not to have those extra 30 people come into work. I can just say, hey, you're, gonna all get, you're all going to get B+, plus, so those 30 of you, get out of the lecture. Okay? And then I can just have the lecture exactly among the extra, you know, the 45 of you here. That's going to be done. Yeah? So that's how you justify monotonicity. You, the firm always has an option of not having those new machines or new labor put to use. So having more means you can have the earlier labor capital arrangement as before at least. Just don't come into work. Don't put that machine inside the factory. That's what I'm talking about, okay? Um, so I always talk about these. I mean, I'm, I asked for a couple of years in the exam, how will this monotonicity assumption breaks down, you know, break down in actual reality? And people always come up with creative answers like, you know, um, the answers that sort of I, ha I haven't even imagined. Like, for example, one student I remember in Yuxa, uh, uh, Korea Military Academy, wrote down an answer saying, what if the new workers hired are um, sort of like hardline trade union members who inst instill a lot of feelings of resentment among existing workers and try and motivate a new strike. Now, I don't use that sort of example because it's so politically biased, but that's another way to think about sort of how more workers might not always be beneficial in reality, okay? Second, technologies, te bah, technologies are convex. If certain capital labor arrangement and another capital labor arrangement produce the same level of output, then a weighted average of those two must also at least produce at least as much as before. That sounds like weird, but I mean, we already know the meaning of convexity, right? But what we need to know now is how can you apply that to the context of production? Okay, so think about a case of um, secretaries producing certain documents. You might have a situation where 100 secretaries are sharing two computers to produce output. Or same thing can be done by 10 secretaries having access to 200 computers. That's okay, but that's really inefficient arrangement. One's in the real extreme, you know, like one's got huge amount of labor and little amount of computer, which is basically what you get if you want to use Stator on the basement computer room, for example. 
or you get very little worker but excessive amount of machines. So if you take a rated average of it, so about 100 workers getting roughly, say, 50 computers, then that's going to be a much more efficient set of arrangement. Having incredible amount of worker and no machine, very little machine, or having incredible amount of machinery and little amount of worker, that's not a nice arrangement. So we are, you know, averages are better than extremes. That same argument holds in production as well. And that's the meaning of convex technologies. Okay? And it is, I think, a reasonable assumption in many industries. Now, so in finance even, suppose there are a lot of analysts trying to trade on equity stuff, whatever, but they are sharing two Bloomberg terminals between 100 people. That's not going to work. There are, suppose there are about two or three analysts trying to cover extreme amount of stock, but there's a huge surplus of 120 or whatever Bloomberg terminals, that's not going to be efficient either. Generally, you know, you would have one worker getting about two or three monitors, and between two or three of them getting one Bloomberg terminal access. That's a good arrangement. And that's a sort of how I would justify this convexity assumption. Okay? Now, marginal products and technical rates of substitution are also important concepts. These are all related to what we have learned already before. Marginal product is just like marginal utility. It's, if you have the production function, the first partial derivative with respect to that input. So, for example, um, in terms of math-wise, if you have... something like that, then x1 being labor, x2 being capital, then marginal product of labor at this point is that, nothing more, okay? And without using calculus, it's basically saying if you increase a little amount of labor, labor by a little amount, how much will your production increase by? Okay? Now, crucially, there's also an equivalent rate concept for marginal rate of substitution. Now, MRS was a concept. Does anyone remember what MRS was? The ratio between two marginal utilities. Okay. Yep. And that was the slope of Sorry, slope of what? <laughs> slope of marginal utility? No, no, no. It's a ratio of two marginal utilities. It can't be the slope of utility or marginal utility. It's the slope of indifference curve. And that's the reason why I bring it up. Because for indifference curve, we have an equivalent concept called isoquant. So for marginal rate of substitution, we have equivalent rate, equivalent concept called technical rate of substitution. 우리말로는 한계는 떼기도 하고요. 기술 대체율 또는 한계 기술 대체율이라고 합니다. 한계 대체율이 마진 rate of substitution이었고 기술 대체율 또는 한계 대체율. So that TRS is the ratio of two marginal products just like earlier. And that therefore ladies and gentlemen is the slope of the isoquant. Now, crucially, we assume that the marginal product of a factor diminishes as the firm adds more of this factor. It will increase. The production will increase, but at a slower rate. Like that. Oh, sorry. That falls. It doesn't fall. It increases, but at a slower and slower and slower rate. How do you justify that? Easy. If you think that a combination of inputs is the key to production. Then think about farming, for example. On a little plot of farm, having no farmer, you get nothing. Having one farmer into it, a lot of production. 
having one more farmer doing all the work, doing all the, you know, getting the weed out. Weed. There must be another word for that. Um, or, or harvesting, etc. That's going to increase production, but not as much as before. But imagine a situation where for a small plot of land, I ask 700 people to do the harvesting and stuff. Add one more there, nothing much will change. Adding one more worker there will probably lead to more or less to zero increase in production there. Second way to justify this is if the firm is hiring a worker with best abilities first. So if I want to promote figure skating, I'm going to you know, hire Kim Yana first, then someone like Asada Mao and stuff like that. But you know, if I want to, I don't know, motivate and if I want to have 20 million figure skaters working in Korea, then people like me who are absolutely crap in terms of like reflexes and like um, just like physical exercise in general when it comes to like reflex based stuff. Even I have to do the job. I'm not going to contribute that much to the world of skate figure skating. Chances are. Yeah. So whichever way you think about it, marginal product diminishes and that's not a difficult thing to justify either. But that also means that if you add more and more and more and more and more of output at low levels of X, what's the marginal product of X going to be like? Large or small? Large or small? It's going to be at high levels of X, what's this going to be like? Very small, right? Now, so we have um, x1 and x2 and we have mp1 over mp2 minus of that as our trs okay now at low levels of x1 and high levels of x2 X1은 작고요. X2는 큽니다. What's the MP2 going to be like? You already have a high amount of X2. So M marginal product will be, think about me having to do figure skating. Marginal product is going to be minute, very small. So this will be small, but there's very little amount of X1. So X1, MP1 will be what? Large. Large thing divided by small thing means the entire term is going to be large in absolute magnitude because there's minus term. The absolute magnitude wise it's going to be large. On the other hand, let's move to here. A lot of x1, little amount of x2. What's going to happen there? x1 is already large, so mp is going to be small. x2 is very little. So it's going to be, marginal product of it is going to be large. Small thing divided by a large thing is going to be small. In absolute value. That means we're going to get a diminishing rate of technical substitution. Diminishing TRS is a byproduct of diminishing marginal product. 한계 생산이 증가, 점증한다고 하면 안 되죠. 점감한다고 해야 돼요. 서서히 그 증가하는 속도가 느려진다고 라 했을 때 앉아. 뭐라고 해야 되지 우리말로? 갑자기 헷갈리네. 체감한다 그래. 그러니까. 외국에서 살다 오고 영어만 가져가다 갑자기 이 순간 되면 이렇게 됩니다. 체감한다는 의미는 TRS 또한 체감한다는 의미입니다. That's how you justify convexity once again. The slope of the isoquant always decreases in absolute magnitude. Okay? Now, they are two separate things, but diminishing marginal product implies diminishing TRS. You can't say the same about diminishing TRS going to diminishing marginal product. 
because they can both increase, but increase at a different rate, and you can generate it. But diminishing marginal product will generate diminishing TRS. 한 개의 생산 체감은 기술 대체율의 체감을 의미합니다. 거꾸로는 안 된다 했습니다. 기술 대체율이 체감한다고 해서 한개 생산이 체감하는 건 아니라고요. 그 이유는 생각해 보시게. So that's that. But in producer theory, we make one more incredibly important assumption or, or distinction rather. We distinguish between short run and long run. Now, there's a famous quote by John Maynard Keynes saying, in the long run, we are all dead. So that's one definition of a long run, the time needed for us to die, basically. But um, in producer theory, we take a very specific definition between short run and long run, 단기 and 장기. Short run and long run is distinguished as follows. In the short run, there must be at least one factor of production whose quantity is fixed. Okay? Um, without prejudice, I take, suppose, Han Joo-san as example. Okay? Now, suppose that Han Joo-san decides to become a very flourishing young entrepreneur and she decides to set up a startup selling accessories on an off offline flagship store somewhere, okay? In the sh so she hires a little room, show window room somewhere in Gangnam and opens up a store. Uh, it's a social enterprise. Suppose that um, accessories are made by, I don't know, 사회적 기업이라고 하고 합시다. 뭐 누가 만들었다고 할까요, 그냥? 그냥 랜덤하게, 아무나. 그냥 뭐. By single moms, okay? I don't know, I don't know. Without pressure, let's try and, you know, be realistic, okay? Um, actually, that's one thing that my wife tried to do for a while before she sort of gave up. Um, she had a little bit of a shopping mall going on for baby accessories, you know. Baby hairbands and hairpins made by moms, you know, for our daughter's sort of concept. Um, that kind of was going well. I don't know why she sort of stopped the business, but that's actually sort of a moonshine work, you know. She's working in Samsung, so she, I'm being recorded, aren't I, actually? <laughs> uh, so um, that's that. But let's suppose she does. She does incredibly well. I don't know, she um, set up a nice web page, gives a very nice niche French name, whatever, I don't know, what, Fle de Chusan or whatever, something like that. Uh, and then does well. But her lease for that office space is for two years. So until she has money, she can't really expand to a second, third franchise stores. That's what I mean by short run. Your land, your pro factor of production, rented building is fixed. You can't do anything about it. Suppose if you want to open a bakery, you can hire more part-time workers <coughs> easily overnight you can you can do go to Albamon um, or other apps um, open an ad saying we need more workers uh, you can have machineries brought in quite easily in case of flare did you son um, you can have more like glue guns and more what's needed for I don't know various other accessories and stuff like that coming in, raw material, machinery, that's easy. But land is fixed, yeah? Office space is fixed. But in the long run, if she flourishes, she does really well, her profits are in hundreds of millions of won. So she gets an interview done by Woman Sense and stuff like that. Um, you know, the best under 30s, et cetera, stuff. Then in the long run, she'll have enough profit and enough ability to generate new stores and that land will no longer be fixed. See the difference? You can adjust a certain amount of factors of production in the short run, but at least one thing has to be fixed. One quantity cannot be changed. If everything is sort of flexible, then at that point we can say that 
x ก็ลงไป the sort of another example I use a lot is airline industry so our new aircraft cannot be bought overnight for example <coughs> I happen to be a little bit of an airline enthusiast, and I flew a lot, so I know I happen to know this actually. Um, Asiana sold to London route, London Heathrow to Seoul, was a very, very profitable route, but they couldn't do it for more than four times a week until about two to three years ago, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday departure, because they didn't have enough aircraft. And that same aircraft had to go into London, come back, and then that same evening it would have to depart for Sydney three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, when it doesn't depart for London. So that's a fixed factor, capital. You can't change the number of aircraft. But over time, you get new Boeing 747-800s, 777s, 8787s, A380s. You, have, you purchase the order, you exercise the options, it's going to be delivered over time. So in about two, three, four years, you can change the scale of your firm. And then at that point, you can serve more routes. Sydney, five times a week. London, every day. Therefore, in the long run, something called the scale of production becomes important. That's quite different from marginal product. Marginal product is important in the short run. Fix one thing, change another. That's like partial derivative, right? Fix every other factor. How will changing labor affect production? Here, you're affecting, you're changing everything by the same proportions. The relative proportion between capital and labor remain the same. You, ink, you double the labor, double the capital, double the land. How will that affect your production? So for those coming in from mass department, it's, it's related to the concept called degree of homogeneity. So the most likely case that we examine is something called CRS, constant returns to scale. If you double the labor and double the capital, what do you get? Double the output. So you're actually copying what you're doing. That's how you justify it. A company can set up a second factory with exactly the same layout, exactly the same number of workers, doing exactly the same thing, using the exactly the same amount of knowledge. Why can it not copy the same amount of production? That's how you justify constant returns to scale. Double the, double the machines, double the workers, double the output. But in other industries, that might not be a reasonable assumption. That's fine for certain industries. So think about somewhere like Emart. If you open a new store, if you design the building in exactly the same way, if you put in the same amount of stockers, cashiers, everything, you're likely to get similar amount of output. But in other industries, we get stuff like increasing returns to scale. If you double the labor and double the capital, that's how much you get in terms of production. That's more than double your original output. Two uh, what sort of example can we think of? It's a sort of industry where economies of scale becomes important. So somewhere like Tesla's production line, at low levels of machinery and worker, it could produce production really slowly. That was going, Tesla had a lot of orders, but like Model S and stuff like that were going always behind, behind, behind the schedule. Now they opened a huge new factory for batteries and they're now working in association with Panasonic, much more scale. Do 
say, quadruple the scale, but the production is increasing by much more than four times the original amount. That sort of industry may be increasing returns to scale. We can also think of, you know, other industries with decreasing returns to scale as well. Perhaps. Increasing returns to scale um, happens quite often in storage-related industry because it comes in quite a bit. It's quite related to the sort of law of physics and mathematics as well. Okay? Um, suppose that if you're trying to build a huge tank in spherical sort of way, then your raw material has to come in from the, your, the amount of raw material needed will be related to what? The surface area of the sphere. 그 구의 표면적에 비례해서 필요해집니다. So, double the surface area. So if you surface area increases at a square of the power. But the volume contained 3분의 4 pi r 3제곱이죠? Volume increases at a rate of what? Q. So if you double the amount of workers and double the amount of raw material, the amount of container that the volume that you want to hold increases by cubic rate, increase at a rate of cubic rather than quadratic. That's a sort of a good example of increasing returns to scale. You build a facility at a rate of doubling the material, but the actual volume increases at cubic rate. So that's the sort of industry, but um, for most industries, I would say constant returns to scale has intuitive appeal. You hire new workers, give them exactly the same new machinery, ask them to duplicate what people are doing at the other factory. Why can you not produce the same amount of output once trained well enough? So that's the sort of argument that one would use. But... Um, output is not the end of it. We have to look at profit end of the things as well. So we're going to cover a little amount of profit maximization end of the things today, and then we're going to carry it over a little bit to the next lecture as well. Okay? Now, having described a firm's technology, it's time to look more closely into the firm's single most important Objective. What do firms do? Make output. For what purpose? To maximize profits. 이윤이 회사가 인 존재하는 가장 확실한 이유죠. So okay. So suppose that a firm produces n outputs. Think about. I don't know. 농심. Each output might be 새우깡, 신라면, 너구리, 또뭐 있죠? 포카칩도 농심이든가? 아무튼 뭐 그런 식으로. So like, like that or um, other, other example might be 하이트 진로, making 하이트 and 참이슬, etc., etc. 참이슬 fresh, 참이슬 첫그 뭐죠? 요즘 유자 유자 나온 거 뭐더라? 네? 순하리는 처음처럼이고 참이슬도 나온 거 있잖아. 그거 참이슬 자몽이 나왔죠. 참. 뭐 그런 것들. So sort of output price. And for each output, there will be a price, right? Using M input, machinery, workers, raw material, land, at each of their factory will have their own prices as well. Managers will need to be paid a certain amount. Workers will need to be paid a certain amount. Renting a production machine will be a certain amount, etc., etc. Then, essentially this is it. Revenue minus cost is the profit. 
nothing that difficult. But here's the important thing. As a true economist, however, the proper definition of factor price, in other words, cost of employing input, must always include the opportunity cost as well. So it's like this. Um, suppose that, uh, I don't know, um, Yubom Jin Hak-seng's parents uh, work, um, own a Japanese restaurant, say, okay? It'd be weird if, he actually, if they actually did, but suppose they are, okay? And suppose that Yubom Jin Hak-seng gets dressed in the sort of Japanese dress and serves the whole three times a week. In return, he gets nothing his parents love, yeah? The most important, invaluable thing that we cannot replace. Thank you, everything's good. But from a Temujepyo or financial statement perspective, that means that his parents have employed him at zero cost, accounting-wise. Yeah? Right? And <laughs> 왜 갑자기 왜 경상도 말도 말 듣도 보도 못한 사투리가 나오는 걸까? 심지어 비슷하지도 않은. Anyway, but um, that doesn't mean that from an economic perspective, their parents have employed him at zero cost. Because the opportunity cost of Yubam Jin Hakseng's labor has to be taken into account. If he didn't work for his parents out of his love, out of his love or, I don't know, whatever purpose that drove him to work there, he could have worked somewhere else as a part-time labor. He could have worked somewhere else in certain... Um, certain labor and could have got some money. So that's the opportunity cost of his labor. He could have provided his labor as somewhere else and got enough money, um, a certain money. He, that free labor must be valued at going market price at which he could have worked elsewhere in either say Pyeonijam or in some other Japanese restaurant or something like that. That's the true definition of opportunity cost, right? The best next alternative. So when we properly value all inputs and outputs that way against the next opportunity cost, so that must be same for all other inputs as well, even the managers, either, even the top people. Even, you know, his parents must also value their own profit according to opportunity cost. Hey, maybe we can change to being a Chinese restaurant. Maybe we can change to being a Spanish restaurant. How will that give us? Will that earn more profit? So in other words, your opportunity cost must be the true barometer against you valued your profit. So there's where the definition of accounting profit and economic profit differ. In accounting ways, a firm will report positive returns, positive profits. Doesn't mean that that corresponds to true positive economic profit. What about your next best alternative? Accounting doesn't take that into account. Economically though, you should. Generally that's the reason why accounting profits are ten tend to be higher than economic profits. But, as we have seen from the previous discussion on long run v short run, it may be difficult to adjust some inputs over a short period of time. I have leased certain office space at one million one for next two years, or something like that. Contractual obligations on machine rentals, property lease, etc. So, if a particular input is fixed, then we call it a fixed factor if certain, certain, certain factors of production can be adjusted freely, then 
we call it variable factor. The reason why I'm distinguishing here is because presence of fixed factor means you can actually produce negative profit in the short run. 되게 간단한 경우입니다. I'm Korean first and English. 수익을 조금은 내는데 임대료 커버할 만큼 수익이 안 나요. 그럼 어떻게 써요? 총 따져봤을 때는 마이너스 나겠죠? 초반에 한그 음식 팔고 어쩌고 해서 이윤이 한 7, 80 나는데 임대료가 200이에요. 이런 경우, right? So it's like this. You 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 you're running a restaurant, you know, I don't know, um, specializing in any any preference, Thai, Vietnamese, whatever. So you're making some money on it, but not enough to cover your lease, your so your rental price. You you, know, you have to rent a space to start a restaurant. You're making money, but just not enough to cover that. Then you might be making short negative profits in the short run. So I probably go on a little bit more here, and then I'm going to stop at 5:15. So suppose that input two is your office space or land or whatever or capital, whatever. It's fixed as some x2. That is x2 bar. Print는 저거 제대로 나왔죠. 맨날 깨지는데. 예. Yeah. Then, then suppose then a firm produces only one output at price P and W1 and W2 are the respective input prices. So your, essentially your problem is this. If for every output you make using your input, you can get P. So that's your revenue. Then you have to pay your labor, then you also have to pay for your rental, which is fixed. You can't do anything about it. What's the only thing that you can change here? 바꿀 수 있는 게 뭐죠? 나의 choice variable, 선택할 수 있는 선택 가능 변수가? X1이 뭡니까? Labor. How many people will I employ to make food, make pastas, make bailas, whatever? So that's the reason why the entire thing has to be differentiated with respect to x1 in the short run. Only labor. First order condition gives. Now remember that differentiating your production function with respect to one variable was that variable's marginal product. minus W1 is zero, or equate the two. That means that that's actually a, one of the most important predictions in microeconomics. People in the optimum are paid their marginal product. That's, that's, that's one of the most important thing in economics. People, pay, people get paid to how much the value of marginal value of their production. In other words, if they produce 10 pastas, which can be sold at 10,001. 10 times 10 is 100. That will be equated to your wage. Wage is 100,000. Or, in other words, from a firm's perspective, 회사 입장에서 봐야죠, 회사 입장에서. It will hire as much labor as up to the point where the marginal value that that worker generates, 10 past at 10,001, happens to equal his wage. In other words, you have to extract from him at least how much you pay him. Okay? That's the most important prediction in microeconomics when it comes to producing things. So that's the easier sort of differentiation, calculus-based ways to express the optimal 
solution. Another way to do it is through graphical illustration. This is where I'm going to recap and start my lecture from Friday, by the way, okay? Now, when we look at a firm's output level, so we suppose that Y is a firm's sum output level. Whatever abstract number it can take, okay? For each output, for each output level, your profits are given by pi equals py minus w1x1, the, your labor cost, minus your capital cost. Okay? Or, if you put these two into there, then rearranging this gives output as a function of Profit divided by price, this divided by price, this divided by price. Okay? Now, if you graphically illustrate this in the y, x1 space, y being the output, x1 being the labor, then notice this. For each level of profit, 각각의 레벨로 파이마다 어떤 게 생깁니까? You get a very unique line. 각각의 레벨마다 하나의 라인이 있겠죠. That is called the ISO profit line. Like this. Okay? For each level of each line corresponds to the same level of profit. 인디퍼런스 값하고 똑같은 거예요. 요 지금 이 선상에 있는 모든 점들이 다 똑같은 수준의 이윤과 correspond 하는 겁니다. It corresponds to the same profit. If you're on the same as the profit line, 이거는 뭐라고 할까요? 참고로 등 이윤 곡선이라고 하죠. Why do I have to do this? Now, why does this slope upward? Simple. If you hire more worker, you have to pay him more. So the only way that you can generate as much, out, as much profit as before is if that worker contributes more to the output and produces more revenue. 그러니까 X1이 늘어나면 Y도 늘어나야 되는 거죠. 새로 노동을 더 고용을 했으면 어쩔 테니까. 돈이 더들 테니까. 그만큼은 최소한 걔가 커버를 해줘야지 똑같은 이윤 예전에 똑같은 수준의 이윤에 남아 있겠죠. So, the question then, next, on Friday, what's going to happen is, how does this correspond to the actual production function? 얘가 production function하고 만날 때의 딱 optimal point가 우리가 아까 방금 미적분적으로 본 optimization, 최적화한 지점과 똑같다라는 거를 볼 겁니다. But it's 5.15 and I don't want to overrun the lecture today. I'm going to do it at some other point. So this is a good point to stop. Thank you and see you on Friday.